All right. Hi, everyone. We're at the final stretch here. Who here believes that blockchain can shift the paradigm of video technology? How many people have heard of LivePeer? Awesome. My name is Rafi. I'm the head of operations and business development in LivePeer. And what we're going to talk about today is how LivePeer is shifting the paradigm of video infrastructure by reducing the cost of transcoding by 50x. I know you spent a lot of your day talking about technical implementations. We're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about why we believe that live streaming is going to be the first real world use case for Ethereum to disrupt an existing industry. Okay. All right. Um, so, video today, the way it works is first of all, it's insanely expensive. Today, a broadcaster, and this could, I say broadcaster, and it could be a fitness streaming app like Peloton, it could be a telehealth company, it could be a video gaming company like Twitch. No matter who it is, any broadcaster who wants to distribute video to their users in a high quality way needs to transcode it. And what transcoding is, is it's taking a raw video file and it's reformatting it so that no matter what bandwidth you have, 2G or 5G, and no matter what device, you can have the best optimal viewing experience. And this is extremely expensive. It costs $3 per stream per hour, just for the transcoding. So if you're a company like Twitch, you're paying millions of dollars as an operating expense line just for the transcoding. And then from there, what you do is you send the video to a content delivery network, which are also controlled by closed proprietary software providers. Now, this problem is only growing. Today, video is 80% of all internet bandwidth use, broadband usage. And this is expected to grow. Why? Number one, there's an explosion of content online. Every single brand is connecting with their audience through video because it's the most engaging. The percent of population who has access to internet is growing by 7% year over year. The, the quality of broadband is about to increase exponentially with the advent of 5G. Um, and there's more and more devices. So as consumers, we're expecting to be able to watch video on our way to work, on our iPhone, on our watch, no matter what. And so this is putting a huge demand on video infrastructure, and we believe that peer-to-peer -peer and cryptocurrency is the path forward. So what we're doing is we're dramatically reducing the cost of video infrastructure so that no matter if you are a small company or a large company, you can access this and be able to optimize the experience for your viewers. So let's use an example. Strive is a startup. They are helping high schools stream video of their sports games so that your granny or your uncle who's in Idaho can watch your daughter play sports um, in real time. Now, today, they've got about 100 games that they're streaming to about 100 viewers every week. This costs them nearly $42,000 a year. And they're gaining traction. And the more viewers that they have, and the more streams that they have, the more, the more they have to pay as an operating expense to be able to grow. So they cannot today afford this level of scale given the cost structure. Now, today, all these transcoding software providers are ultimately run by under, the underlying infrastructure is controlled by a few large providers like Amazon. Um, imagine a world where this infrastructure could be globally distributed and decentralized. Well, that is what we are doing. The Live Peer Protocol coordinates computation resources around the world to transcode video. We're harnessing cheap, idle GPU capacity provided by the greatest supercomputer in the world, which is cryptocurrency mining networks. We have an API that provides broadcasters with access to this cheap, affordable, highly scalable computation resource. And what's especially interesting is that over time, 
the protocol can be used beyond video computation. So this is what LivePeer enables. You, it enables a 98% cost reduction of transcoding. So while it costs $600 a week for Strive with existing players, it costs eight bucks with LivePeer. It's low latency, it's high reliability, and most importantly, it's democratized value. So how does this actually work? So the broadcaster sends the video to the LivePeer network. And nodes on the, on the LivePeer network which we call transcoders, are competing based on price and capabilities to be able to do the work. Now, once the job is complete, um, they send the, and it's verified, they send the video to whatever the, today, to whatever the broadcaster's CDN is today, um, or directly to storage if it's not live streamed. And this could be a decentralized storage solution or it could be centralized. Now, what role does Ethereum and LivePeer token play in this. So when the broadcaster sends the job to the LivePeer network, they're paying the transcoder with Ether. And the transcoders in the network have the privilege of doing the work because they have some minimum amount of LivePeer token staked in the network. And this gives the broadcaster confidence that the transcoder has something to lose, right? That they're incentivized to do the work well, otherwise they'll get slashed. The transcoder um, earns Ether for the jobs that they perform, and they earn inflationary live peer token as a reward for staking their token. Token holders can also participate because it's a delegated proof of stake network. Instead of running the transcoder nodes themselves, a token holder can stake towards a a transcoder to do the work on their behalf. And they earn a portion of the ether and they earn a portion of the live peer token as inflation as well. So here's what, there's many reasons why we like being part of the Ethereum ecosystem, but here are a few. Um, so live peer has its own protocol and it's also built on top of the Ethereum protocol. Number one, fast experimentation. It's a great way for us to experiment quickly at, at a protocol level. Um, b number two, security. Because of the sheer market size of Ethereum, it makes it a powerful tool for security. Number three, consensus. So Ethereum provides consensus, consensus on the same state. So LivePeer doesn't have to worry about nodes coming to consensus. Um, we have consensus using Ethereum. And lastly, the settlement layer. Um, we've seen a lot of tools like stable coins and lending coming out on the Ethereum network, and this helps LivePeer achieve its greater vision over time. So what is, oh, one, oh it might be too late. Okay. Um, what is the vision of LivePeer in the future? So we, I've just kind of laid out, um, we started with, transcoding as a feature, right? But over time, many different services can be built in this decentralized way. And this could be anything from encryption to a decentralized video player to decentralized storage, all using the same underlying architecture. And in, in essence, LivePeer becomes WordPress for video. So one of the questions we think a lot about, because this is a 10-year vision of a fully decentralized video stack, right? How do we sustain development beyond early launch? Now, decentralized technologies, fundamentally, the model allows us to disrupt the innovation model. Um, now, before, we had a choice, money or glory. You had to choose whether you wanted to optimize for investors and their value or for users in open source. But with blockchain, open source is a fundamental building block. So now we have another choice. Are we building protocols or dApps? The FAT protocol thesis hypothesized that all the value would be accrued at the fundamental infrastructure layer. And what happened as a result of that? You saw a lot of smart people coming in and building their own protocol, building their own app with their own token. But we need more applications like MetaMask, like Etherscan. But these were funded by individuals. And that's not necessarily a sustainable way to fund de development long term. 
So in a world where early entrants are outsizedly rewarded for their contributions, how do we, as an ecosystem, continue to fund development over the long term? How do new contributors build a stake that makes them a meaningful, incentivized participant over time? We need to anticipate and provide a path for new contributors so that they can build tools and applications without directly having to purchase the token. And what this does is it results in healthy governance features. And essentially what you're able to do is res continuously reshuffle ownership towards those who are making contributions at the time. Um, so inflation funding is an interesting solution to this problem because a whole economy emerges with many different roles who are allowed to, who are able to capture value. So on the protocol developer layer, they're the ones who are maintaining the protocol and you can have a percent of Genesis token. In Livepeer's case, we kept 5% of the token as an endowment to fund development. Transcoders, in our case, but any sort of validator or keeper, is securing the network and they earn in token inflation. Protocol application developers create user interfaces that make it easier to use and interact with the protocol. And they can build some sort of in-app like percentage fee that they take. They can campaign as a keeper. Token holders curate, they do the work of curating the keepers and holding them accountable. And they are able to keep a reward cut of, an, of inflation. Um, and then lastly, businesses, they can create applications on top and identify arbitrage opportunities. Um, go ahead. So I already kind of laid out the, e the ecosystem and how the broadcaster submits um, the job along with um, Ether and the transcoders earn both that and live peer token and token holders over here on the right are staking their token towards a transcoder and earning live peer token as, as, a, as a reward. Now application developers have an interesting scalable way to capture value here because they are able to build applications for token holders, for transcoders, for investors like dashboards that make it easier to use and secure the protocol. And um, next. And so what they're able to do is they're able to campaign as keepers and get token holders to stake towards them. Because what, the e what, what you're able to do in this ecosystem is that the token holders are basically voting on who gets to be a transcoder with their token, right? And in doing so, what they're doing is they are also agreeing to an amount of their inflation that they're willing to give to the transcoder. Maybe if the infrastructure provider running the transcoder was also building an application, like a staking application or an alert notification, I might be willing as a token holder to give more of my inflation reward back to the transcoder. For example, I run a community node, transcoder node, and my and our inflation reward cut is 50%, and it's used to fund future development. And people are willing to do that because they know that it's going to overall appreciate the value of the network. Um, and so, in, so what you're able to do is application developers are able to um, go beyond just depending on one individual to agree to pay them to build a tool, and they're able to campaign to, to the ecosystem and say, hey, this is what I, what I want to build, and people essentially vote with the way that they stake their token. And businesses also can build businesses on top of LivePeer to make it more usable for um, broadcasters. And so what you essentially have here is you've got these business services built on open source software, with a shared infrastructure and transparent pricing. And so now let's talk about a few examples of some of the tools that have been built in the live peer network because of this sort of model. There's a project, a company called Supermax that builds dashboards for protocol ecosystems. Um, they help our token holders understand the economics of what's going on in the ecosystem to make better decisions about how they stake their token. Um, another one that, we, that has come out of our ecosystem is called Bison Trails. 
Bison Trails both created a, they open sourced a script. I don't know how many people here participated in the Merkle mine, anyone? Okay, um, well, sorry. Um, the, the Merkle mine basically allowed you to mine community allocated tokens upon network launch to mainnet. And Bison Trails open sourced a Merkle mine script for anyone to be able to use. They also open sourced a alert notification that transcoders could get alerted if their node went down so they could go quickly fix it. Another one that just um, happened is the live peer subgraph. And so this is a tool that allows us to index and query um, the blockchain and get d pull data in a very quick way. And I think this is a really good example because what it did for the, the community of LivePeer is that it made the experience of staking a lot faster than it was before. And this is important because it's an example of how, you know, maybe in Web 3.0, speed and user experience isn't today prioritized, but it does need to compete. And this is an example of how you don't have to compromise decentralization um, for user experience. So, um, this is a little bit about, number one, why we think that LivePeer is going to be the first use case for, of Ethereum disrupting an existing market. And we talked a little bit about what it will take for the ecosystem to be able to realize this long-term 10-year vision. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, a few things. One, we're hiring a protocol engineer. We just published the job post yesterday. Two, um, if you're interested in hacking on something, you can check out the community, live peer community node GitHub, or there's a ton of different research opportunities. And lastly, if you want to play around with staking, if you email me in the next 10 minutes, what time is it? If you email me in the next 10 minutes, I'm happy to send you a couple live peer tokens to play around with the Explorer and participate in the network. So thanks. Um, any questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks. So there's this other project, open source project, that's not at all in the blockchain space called um, PureTube, that is essentially trying to do the other side of uh, video distribution, which is replace YouTube with um, a network of federated um, network of federated instances that run PeerTube that uh, can share each other's catalog of videos. And when a video gets popular, it can be streamed over BitTorrent with using basically this thing called, I think, WebTorrent. Mm -hmm. There might be ways for the two projects to work together because one side can do the... Currently, is, in my understanding, is that on PeerTube currently, if you want to transcode, you basically have to run that transcoding on the local machine that is hosting the instance. Mm -hmm. So there might be something to do yeah. there. Hi. Uh, how are you trying to uh, to prove that uh, the transcoding is uh, is verified and is correct? Yeah. yeah. So um, there's a few different options that broadcasters have. They can verify it themselves. We've been doing ongoing research with Truebit, where once the transcoder signals that they've completed the job, um, that they they submit a hash with kind of the compilation of all of the different segments that they've done, and that invokes a verification process with Truebit. Um, we're also doing additional research that we just kicked off with a company called Epic Labs to look into other ways of doing verification beyond Truebit as well. Hey, um, do you have any thoughts on why the costs of transcoding are so high in conventional offers if, they're, if you're able to provide them for so much less? Yeah. So. So there's the software layer that a transcoder service provider charges, and they're taking some under the hood. There's the operating expense of building the software, but you all, they also ultimately have to run the software to transcode the video on servers. And because of the 
like the sheer amount of scale that you need, they're ultimately using AWS for their, to run the transcoder nodes because each AWS server can only transcode four live streams at a time. And it costs $700 a month to rent an AWS server. So the more servers, you, the more streams that your customer has, the more you have to scale out your infrastructure and it's too cost intensive for them to invest in it themselves, especially at the rate the video is growing. And so this is essentially like the beauty of what we're doing is that we are harnessing idle GPU power to do the computation around the world because it's already, so each GPU chip in a crypto mining rig has an unutilized graphic card. Each graphic card can transcode four streams at the same time of mining whatever other currency they're doing. So this is just additional income for them with um, very little additional OPEX. So they're willing to do the price way lower. Cool, thanks. <laughs>